Emma Rice, how are you? <laughs> oh, Paul, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm home after a long two weeks because we've been live broadcasting Romantics Anonymous. And it's been really intense because of the, um, the new way of working, which is has sort of everything that you've built up in your career, all the things you think you know, are out of the window because there was no contact. We were sort of bathed in sanitizer. Um, working a really different way and working digitally. So I'm exhausted, but really proud. <laughs> I, you should be proud. I, um, we saw it here in America. We, there was, I think, six venues here in the, in the US hosting uh, the, the, the show on, yeah. on Saturday. And, um, and it was fantastic. I mean, it, what was lovely, actually, was, uh, for me anyway, was that um, you introduced it at the, at the beginning from the auditorium where all of the technical team are, are sitting. Five minutes into the into the run, we knew there was a slight technical problem with the sound, and it stopped, and we all stopped, and you had to, sorry guys, we're gonna have to start again. And it was just, it it made us realise. I it made me feel anyway. I was in the room with you. It made me feel uh, that we were we were certainly watching a live performance, and all the the good and the bad that goes with a live performance. But uh, how I mean, how was that for you that on the Saturday night? Well you know the answer to this, which is it was, it was thrilling. It was live. You know, I mean, we, we'd been feeling a little bit like we were making a film because, you know, I was busy. We were live editing and trying to get all the best shots. Yeah. So I was, we were getting sucked down the visual element. And of course, what happened in that moment is why we do it. It's in the moment, it's live. Um, and the adrenaline is phenomenal. And the room is phenomenal. You know, we all pulled together watching I mean, I just describe it like the Starship Enterprise, you know, Simon was there like Captain Kirk and Jay was like Spock trying to work out what was wrong. And I mean, I was pointless. I was, uh, I mean, I just, I was hoping I'd be Uhura, but I wasn't as useful as Uhura was. So, um, but it was really, really thrilling and, and really gave that sense of a community. Um, it, it felt old school, which you all understand, is it really did feel old school. I mean, we just looked at each other that night and it was thrilling, which is ridiculous because it went wrong. But, but like you say, I think in, in that moment, the, whoever was watching understood that we were somewhere on the planet trying to make this happen. It was, it was amazing. So yeah, I've had some real highs and, and really old school highs. You know, the, as you get older, you get better at what you do and you, you refine your techniques. And we were just winging it in lots of ways. Yeah. A really high standard, but winging it. And it was thrilling. It was really thrilling. It was, I mean, from my point of view, watching it as well, what was, what was great was, I mean, I, I love the introduction at the beginning anyway, because you, we, we knew, you know, you set the, the, the tone and you set the, the, the place where we were at. You know, we were talking to you in the auditorium. You were very clearly showing us what was there and you were introducing us to all the people involved. And then we would sort of go into that and focus in, but we sort of knew where we were and that was great. I think that was a really clever move actually to introduce the, the, the production. But then, and then when it went wrong, of course, you know, we all sat, we all held, you know, we all held our nerve and we sort of knew, I sort of knew it was going to be okay, but you know, I always think that, so that's always been my way. And, and it was okay. And then you know, I knew you'd get the, you know, you'd find a solution. But what was then lovely was when we were watching that, for that it didn't feel like a film. I didn't feel that we were, it was all so precise and, and, uh, and edited to a, within an inch of its life. It felt real and it felt like we were in a theater and you know, you were, the camera positions were fantastic, um, but it was just, it didn't feel like we were watching a film and that's what, and that surprised me. I mean, I didn't really know that was gonna happen. And that I think was the, for me, the biggest success because I felt I was in a theatre production, watching a theatre production, but you were just sharing it with us and you were catching all the moments, you were getting the close-ups, but it didn't feel like we were in a film. We just, so that was, uh, that was uh, for me, the most uh, remarkable bit, actually, uh, that, that it did, you know, I really watched a production, a theatre production. Um, that's, that was remarkable for me because as a theatre maker, I'm, I'm passionate about an audience and the interaction with an audience. Yeah. So what you're describing makes me feel really happy because you know, when, when I did do the intro, it was because I wanted to do what I call the pre-show. You have to say to people, this is where we are. This is reality before you suck them into the, the fantasy world or the fictional world. But, but 
you know, we did, we were trying to get it very high production values, but I didn't want it to feel like a film. I didn't want it to feel shiny. And especially on the night that you saw it, the American night, it, it had an element of poor theatre about it, even though it was digital. We were, and I love that. It was, you know, what's CGI? Yeah. Uh, cardboard glue and imagination. <laughs> No, it was, it was, it was, it was, it, what it, it, for me, it, it sucked me in. It made me want to listen to that story. It made me, I didn't want to leave the screen. You know, I didn't want to leave the, the, the theatre seat or the seat I was in. And, uh, you know, I've seen other theatre productions that are beautifully shot. And I will get up and go and make a cup of tea, and, you know, doing it because it's a film. Because I know I can stop it. I can pause it. I can start again. I knew I couldn't stop and pause this. I had to stay with it. I had to keep, you know, focused. And uh, I was slightly waiting for something to go wrong as well, just because I love when things do go wrong, you know, in the, in the nicest possible way. We talked about that, you know, at knee-high days, you know, we, we celebrated uh, the mistake. We celebrated something going wrong. And, uh, and it, nothing did go wrong, but, it, you know, you, it was that feeling of live performance, which I loved. I mean, there were things yeah. wrong, probably, but I don't, you know, you wouldn't know from the audience point of view. We definitely had jeopardy that night, <laughs> which is a very valuable thing, isn't it, in all arts? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's great. So just... Tell me a little bit about, well, two things really. Tell me a little bit how this production came together because, you know, obviously we were going to bring this production to the Wallace um, in March and obviously the world changed. But the, the history of this production and, and the people you've been working with on this production, some old collaborators that, you know, you've worked with for years, but some new. So just tell yeah. me a little bit about the history of the piece. Well, um, I was first approached, I can't even remember, many years ago, um, and in fact, I was in America by some American producers who gave me a film to watch, Romantic Synonymous. Now, at that time, as you all know, my default setting was say no to everything. But I was in America. I did have very little to do. And I watched this film and I can remember thinking, damn it, it's perfect. And that there's, a, there's a funny thing when you're thinking about work is I often think to myself, can I bear for somebody else to make this piece? And I couldn't. I just thought, well, this has just got me running through it. And um, writing a musical is a long process. And it's particularly a long process when you're across continents, because I was working with the writing partnership, Cumin and Diamond. Fantastic um, American musical writing team. So we were getting to know each other, getting to know the form. And we were, I think we were at a first draft phase. We'd done a workshop by the time I got my job at the Globe, Shakespeare's Globe. And that was overwhelming. The job was so huge, the organisation so important. And the one thing the Globe wasn't on the planet to do was new musicals. So in fact, I bowed out. I, I, we, I said, look, I think I can't commit to the amount of work it would take to do a new musical. And then events happened. My, uh, my tenure at the Globe was not boring, shall we say, and was also not long. So <laughs> I, um, it was agreed that I would only do two years tenure after only six months. And I had to decide at that point as an artist, what was I going to do with these precious 18 months? Honoured the globe, but also gave me some, um, some food for my soul and some agency. And I thought, you know what? I've got this musical that's almost ready to go. And I thought, wouldn't that be amazing to do certainly the first and maybe the last musical at the globe, to do it in this tiny Jacobean picture box theatre by candlelight? Um, and I, I thought it would be amazing for the Globe and amazing for the musical because, as you know, musicals are almost always looking for the, a, a traditional path that might end up in the West End or on Broadway. And it really, um, I loved it. My subversive heart loved the thought that we might open this with almost no technology at all, that we would make it just for the story and for the storytelling. So it was my final show at Shakespeare's Globe. It was like a chocolate box itself. We did it in this tiny wooden theatre and I made it with total love, which was so important for me at that time in my life because it was, it was a painful chapter. So Romantics Anonymous was a very um, loving full stop to it. We, we just decided, I can remember saying to the room, we're just going to have fun. We're going to work with love and with positivity and make something really beautiful. And that was what I left the globe dancing on air with. So it was really important to me. And then um, it's carried on. So we remounted it. And as you say, it was about to come to you, which is, 
I mean, but what's, what has made us laugh a lot is the set actually did come to you. Yes. So the set that you saw on Skype on Saturday on Zoom was, has been to LA and come back and has been to Bognor Regis. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very British joke. <laughs> it's a very down on its luck seaside town. Has been back to Bristol and, you know, it's on its way back to Bognor today, Paul. Is it? Is it? Is it? Oh. I, I, so the set has been on a bigger tour than the than the show, but it meant the world to not say goodbye when COVID happened because we really felt that we were onto something so special. So you yeah. know, it's it's not what we dreamt of, but the fact that you were watching it in Beverly Hills on Saturday is is a thing of great beauty. Yeah, and I saw it in the Globe. I saw it in the Sam Wanamaker space, and um, I remember when you know I you was you 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 was doing it there thinking this how does this work in such a small <laughs> space with no lighting and uh what i just came out i came out of that theater at the end of the production just buzzing just absolutely buzzing and and what i felt about it was i you i think because you'd created it in a space that you shouldn't have created it in it had given you so many uh, sort of challenges on one level, but just so many opportunities because you were having to break all the rules again. You were having to reinvent things. You were having to think out of the box about how you were going to tell this story in a very small space with candlelights. And uh, <clears throat> it completely blew me away. And I just remember thinking, I hope it doesn't, when we scale it up, we don't lose whatever that magic was that we found, you found in the, in the Wanamaker. And you didn't. I mean, that's what I loved about it. It, 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 it scaled up beautifully and it held on to all of those magical moments you've found in in that small space and it's it is interesting how when when you're giving restrictions in theater i think or you're given boundaries and you and you think how do we do this you invent things that you would never normally invent if you're given a full palette and you can do anything you like on the biggest stage and it gives you so many choices sometimes it becomes difficult to know which one to go with but i just remember thinking that is so magical it, it i hope it holds on to that magic when it gets slightly bigger and uh, it absolutely did for me that's why I was so happy thank you well we have long believed that you know boundaries and restrictions are the making of the imagination because if you can have anything you you think literally yeah yeah you know if you want a 10 foot cat to walk through the door you say somebody make me a 10 foot cat but if somebody says well we've, you've only got two pounds 50 you know something different happens something magic and I love that I love all the mimed doors and the silliness it feels like vintage Jack Tati and of course it's it's has no cost you know it's 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 free and yet it makes me smile every time I hear that door squeak it's yeah. very funny. I love it and the turning as you open the door um no, so, uh, and Kuhn and Diamond, now they they were new, I mean, you've got many older collaborators with you on this production, mm -hmm. you know, Les and Malcolm and Simon and, you know, the whole team, but Kunan and Diamond are, for you, a new new team to work with, um, yeah. and we know a little bit about those guys here in LA, uh, and um, so how has it been working with the, with the team? Oh, they're my, my, brothers there it's been absolutely amazing um i mean they're so good i could not have done it without them because my work's always been musical and i've always had music threaded throughout the work but they have it has been musical ah, theater with music rather than musical theater and not um a musical in the simple sense that almost never have i had a character singing their emotions I sometimes have the chorus singing while a character feels, um, but it's, it's quite rare that there's that direct where a character moves into song in my work. And Chris and Michael, they are, they are old school and fresh at the same time. They really understand what a musical needs. And I've learned so much, you know, we, and we've worked as a really fabulous team. I think I knew the shape that I wanted. I knew the aesthetic I wanted. I knew I knew a lot about the way that I wanted the narrative to function theatrically, but they're the ones that said there's a song here or this is where we need to change the pace. They, it's it's in their DNA to understand the rhythm of a musical, and I've just the three of us have bounced along so beautifully together, sort of pursing the baton, and you know so many of the ideas are, th are theirs. You know they've it's been a real shared experience, and they're so funny 
and so true. It's just been absolutely beautiful. Michael, the composer, immediately talked about lots of French music, Debussy and Sarti, which I loved thinking about a French aesthetic going through underground. And Chris has got the most wicked sense of humour, so can land the most glorious joke within a line. And, and yeah, they're my heroes and I'm, you know, and we're definitely in each other's lives forever now because it's been a brilliant experience. And, and, and did, it, did the show, having done it this, this time, did you change anything with the show or have you learned some things you want to develop it further with or are you sort of, are you happy with where you're at with it now? Well, I'm really happy at the moment, but that does not mean that there's no more developments because shows always evolve. Um, I think the big thing that developed with this production was the form, the storytelling form. It was, it was much bumpier at the beginning. I think we hadn't really, I hadn't landed the voice of the storytellers, which is unusual for me because I nearly always know um, the storytelling voice. But that was probably the thing that Chris and Michael had never worked with before. And I hadn't worked in that musical form. And I think we really cracked that this time is how sometimes the narrative voice would come in and when it handed over to, to the actors. So that's very much strengthened. Um, and we, the interval song, which has been rewritten every time we've done it, which I love, it's like a moving um, lens on, the, on life. Because when we first wrote that song, it was at the Globe. So it was all about how the candles might burn you to death. <laughs> <laughs> you know all the various things in a Jacobean theatre yeah and then we rewrote that song for the tour which was about being in a foyer and going to the theatre and then we rewrote it for our covid stay at home audience oh. so that now we've got three versions of that song already and I mean it was such a remarkable achievement in terms of the process I mean I don't go into too much detail because there's obviously an awful lot of detail but how do you manage to get how did you manage to get that show together and put it onto that stage and and you know, perform it. How, what was the process you had to go through with those performers? Um, well, as you say, so it was a very long process, and it, it and be, because this is unprecedented, we had to make, we had to invent the wheel on this, which is hard work and and very stressful, particularly because we were looking at people's health. But simply, um, they they all knew, so they were being careful from the minute they knew that this was happening. Um, they tested three weeks before we started um, re rehearsal, um, before we ended, three weeks before the, hmm. so a week before rehearsals, three weeks before today, tested. We needed everybody to test negative, although we did have a short window of recasting if necessary. Um, then they came to Bristol and retested again with a pinprick test. So we still, we knew that everybody, nobody had COVID in the room and they isolated. They've stayed in apartments. They have not gone to the shops. They've not gone to the pub. They've not gone to get coffees. And everybody's, we've sanitized. In the technical team, we've socially distanced, but the actors have been absolutely rigorous. And it's been a three week isolation period. So it's a big ask. So they haven't seen their family or their partners in some cases. Um, so that was the cost. And it was a one week of rehearsals or more? One week of rehearsals. Then into the theatre to technically rehearse the show. Yeah. So we rehearsed Monday to Thursday. We teched Friday to Monday and we started broadcasting on Tuesday. But the tech was all about the broadcast. You know, the actors teched themselves basically because they, they could see that we were, all the technology was new. I mean, it's certainly at this scale. Simon Baker, who was the, the mastermind behind this and my husband, so I've watched this happen for a long time, um, he he was he was stealing from gaming technology and YouTubers because um, so it was a much more domestic uh, high quality domestic equipment which meant we could have a small team we trained up our own team to do it so there were no trucks outside there were no film crews coming in it was the wise children team skilling up staying socially distant so that's how we did it and we didn't hug either we kept all the social distance we stayed really really rigorous because the one thing that we really couldn't have was anybody getting ill for theatre it's not worth it yeah so you know we're going to test again in two weeks to just really make sure that we kept every member of our team healthy but testing and isolate isolating and being really committed and the company's now gone back to homes and and families yeah so yeah. you dispersed essentially yeah. 
we have dispersed but yeah. without a hug i mean without a party without a hug you know it's it's very uh, you can get used to many new things but i still can't get used to beginnings and ends you can't say hello to people and you can't say goodbye to people so we all uh, we did raise a glass we all had a socially distanced sort of toast but there's a formality that um that isn't real i mean that's the thing is that the the the, the situation is forcing a, a set of behaviors on us that aren't natural mm -hmm. so you know i've had some lovely texts today and almost all of them says you know i'm, I'm missing giving you a hug i'm you know that's it's a really simple thing yeah that we yeah. but we made something special and we certainly felt like a team and probably more like a team than we felt for a while because we we knew we were at the absolute limits of our ability and that and and the other thing that's worth saying is you know actors and creative people can be temperamental and there wasn't a single raised voice there wasn't a single moment of upset the positivity in the room was absolutely uh, heartwarming and joyful th throughout from every stage manager to every actor there wasn't a complaint there wasn't a moan it was magic <laughs> and, I th and and watching it from again seeing it from from my position you know what it what was different i think was you had a, a team full of people in that room but they were all focused on a job that they had to do you know sometimes when you get a technical rehearsal or you're about to go into performance people people's roles of you know they can sit down and watch or they can they, they, their, their job has been done at that point what was obvious to me was that everybody in the room was doing a job right the way through that so the teamwork i imagine was just so fulfilling as well because you were doing oh, things yeah. you've never done before and training you know people on the cameras may not have ever done a cameraman job before yeah. and you know so uh, it, i can imagine that the pressure with i can imagine the the, the, the uh, adrenaline would have been amazing and, it was, uh, yeah. it was, and the camaraderie, yeah, really, really fabulous. Fantastic. So, I mean, you know, out of adversity, these, you know, things, something is possible. Yeah. It would be, we, we would certainly do it again. I think it would be very difficult to make a new show like this, because yeah. I think the intimacy required and the time required for a new show, I think, would be hard with the social distancing. Well, but, a point to make, I suppose, for, for people watching is that, you know, this show had been fully rehearsed, fully designed, was ready to go. So to turn around a show in a week's rehearsal is not a show that you have to start again. It's a, it's a show that you're completely on top of and, and could have performed the next day anyway if you were in, in a normal situation. So um, yeah, I can, you know, it's gonna be a challenge to uh, think how we create new work. Yeah. Um, and what's the plans with, uh, with, with the company now, with Wise Children, your new company, or not new anymore, I suppose, it feels no, new. No, we're getting... Three years or so, is it now? Oh. They're coming up to three years, yeah, two and a, just over two and a half. Yeah. Well, we've got big plans, but of course everything changes, like it must do with you in the States. Um, so the next big show is Wuthering Heights, which is written, designed, cast, ready to go, but on hold, which is a co-production with the National Theatre. And... We're, we're still on the slate, but it is when the theatre can open. But, but I'm very touched that the National is still very much committed to that show. But it keeps getting, you know, when it first happened, we thought the lockdown might be, you know, we might be back to normal in three months. And of course, now the time scale opens up. Yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got a new um, show up my sleeve, which I think I could do socially distanced next summer. Because I thought we've got to respond to this. So I've got that that's a new idea that's crept in. And I've got a couple of writing projects to keep. Um, we'll, we'll talk offline about the new idea. Yes, I w I'd love to, Paul, I'd really love to. Yeah, and uh, no, I think the same, you know, we're having the same issues that we thought we'd be back in, we thought, you know, we'd be back now. And, uh, you know, when it all started and then it's next year and then we don't know when the vaccine, you know, so, that, and the challenges for every country are different, the challenges, or at least the rules are different in every country. The challenges are probably the same, but the rules are different. So we're all trying to work in different ways to solve this. But um, it was just so uplifting to see that on Saturday. And, it, and I think and there's so many people here in America that have emailed me and texted me to say, this was the best thing I've seen for, a, you know. Oh, so thank you. It just brought, you know, brought joy to my heart. And I think that's been the great thing about it. it you have created something that has, has, has brought real joy in a, in, in a time when people are struggling. 
to find that. And I think uh, we're all struggling, I think, to live in this world we're living in now. And there was a moment on Saturday where we forgot that and we were in that story and we were just uh, in love with what was happening. And I think it was, uh, it was such a fantastic thing to do. So uh, we got it, yeah. I just want to take my hat off to you and the team, the whole team have been amazing. Simon, I, I, I just, this is a challenge that no one else could probably have achieved quite the way that Simon did. So, you know, take my hat off to Simon. You had Etta as well, you know, doing the choreography. I mean, it's the old team, from my point of view, you've, you've pulled off something quite unique. So, congratulations, Em. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. And we, well, it was lovely to remember why we do what we do and sort of who we are. You know, we've given our lives to theatre and that's yeah. been taken away from us. So, yeah, yeah. for few short weeks we felt like we were in our own skins again and it was bloody wonderful it was lovely and it was actually lovely to see it on the bristolovic stage which you know from my point of view is, is very nostalgic because it's, it's where i started the, my career in theater but it's also the oldest running theater in the world and the, <laughs> fact the oldest running theater in the world is doing this now was quite a nice uh, uh, thought at, at that time so emma it's lovely to see you send my Thank you. Send my love to all the team. Uh, give them virtual hugs from me. And uh, we'll speak soon. And, and I'm sure we'll speak offline about a number of things. Brilliant. It's fantastic to see you and speak to you. And love to all our friends in America. Take care, Em. Bye-bye. Bye, Paul. Bye. Bye.